Arabian of the Yard. Stories of the war against crime as told by the detective of the century, ex-superintendent Robert Fabian. Here is another true crime story from the memoirs of one of the world's foremost crime detection experts, ex-detective superintendent Fabian of Scotland Yard. My story on this occasion is not strictly one of crime detection, insofar as I really had very little detecting to do. I was reminded of it on reading recently in the paper of a vicious ring of drug peddlers in the United States, whose means of livelihood, and a very lucrative one it was, consisted of selling drugs like marijuana, cocaine, and heroin to youngsters in their teens. This kind of practice I would list along with blackmail as the most vicious on record. No doubt most of you will agree that it is... Hard to imagine any crime more harmful to society than the supplying of habit-forming drugs to teenagers, or for that matter, to anybody at all. In a moment, you will hear the story of Paul Martin, the medical student who became a drug addict after he won the Irish sweep. It was one day in 1934 that Detective Sergeant Fabian came into the picture. A young man had gone to a chemist's shop with a prescription. Twenty grains of morphine sulfate. Hmm. I think there are some other things on the list too, aren't there? Dr. McFaley mentioned that there were some vaccines and a serum, I think. Dr. McFaley, did you say? That's right, Dr. McFaley of Ricelip. I dropped the prescription in for him as a favor. I'm afraid I'm in a dreadful hurry and I can't wait to take it with me. Oh, I see. The, the doctor wants you to send a messenger to Baker Street Station and put the package on the train for him. Oh, well, I expect it'll be all right, sir. Would you mind having a word with the senior dispenser? Uh, not at all. The young man saw the senior dispenser in the shop, and the senior man passed the prescription as in order. But he missed something that the other druggist had noticed whilst watching him talking to the young customer. After the young man had left, he consulted with the chief dispenser and subsequently rang the CID at Marylebone Station Police Station. It doesn't look quite in order, Sergeant, and that's the fact. The pupils of the young man's eyes were definitely enlarged. When he came into the dispensary to speak to the senior dispenser, the pupils didn't contract as a normal man's would. I beg your pardon? Yes, that's right. That is a com common symptom of a drug addict. That's what's worrying us. Well, what will you be wanting us to do, sir? And on the other end of the line, Detective Sergeant Fabian gave his instructions. Well, here's what I'd like you to do. Make up a dummy package apparently containing the vaccines and the morphine and send it on to the train to Ricelip and give me, full, uh, give me a full description of the young fellow, will you? And so, by an elementary trick of police work, Sergeant Fabian caught that night one Paul Rolf Martin as he came to the parcels office of Ricelip Station to collect a small parcel for Dr. McFailey. He showed no excitement when arrested. Fabian took him back to the police station and made him a cup of tea. You know, I can't for the life of me think why you tried to pull such a clumsy trick as this, you know. It's going to ruin your medical career. Yes, of course. Have you passed your first examination? Yes. Hmm. You must be on your intermediate, then. That's right. And yet you prejudice everything by this silly nonsense of obtaining drugs under false pretense. What made you do it? I don't know. Good Lord, man, what's the matter? Here, give me that cup. For mercy's sake, let me have one small dose from that package. I can't do that, Martin. You've got to. You've got to. Do you hear? I can't stand it. Give it to me, Blast. You give it to me. It won't do you any good, Martin. Get hold of yourself, man. Come on, sit down. You fill this wine. Give me that package. No, you don't, oh. son. Careful. Fabian called for the police surgeon who came in and put a merciful end to the violence of Paul Martin with a hypodermic needle. The distressing scene started Fabian off on a train of research into Martin's background. And the story he uncovered was perhaps the most distressing case in all his 28 years at Scotland Yard. Martin's father had been a well-to-do practitioner in Hertfordshire. Paul was to have inherited the practice when he qualified. But Dr. Seaton Martin died suddenly, leaving his widow penniless and his son compelled to take a job as a three-pound-a-week clerk. In his lodging house bedroom each night, Paul Martin studied medicine with books from the free library. He wrote valiant letters to comfort his mother. 
And always through them was, one day I shall be a doctor. Somehow I shall find the money. His landlady was an Irish woman with a lot of faith in the benevolence of Dame Fortune. Well, and now, how would the young doctor be today? Oh, not too bad, thanks, Mrs. Ryan. Could be worse, you know. I've been thinking about that medical course of yours. Look now. If you want money to get through, why not buy a ticket in the Irish sweep? That's a very good idea. The only trouble is you can't win money unless you've got some to start with. I can't afford a ticket, Mrs. Ryan. You know that. Can you not? What are you telling me? You don't have to buy a ticket, lad. Sell a book of tickets, and you can keep the free one that goes with each book. Oh, it is possible to do that, isn't it? Of course it is. And look now. I'll be buying a couple of those tickets myself. That'll help you along. Well, that's very good of you, Mrs. Ryan. I don't feel very lucky, but there's no harm in trying. There certainly wasn't any harm in trying. Mrs. Ryan's faith was more than justified when young Martin won the £12,000 first prize. His trouble seemed to be over. Paul showed his basic good nature by presenting Mrs. Ryan with a handsome cheque and setting his mother up in a cosy house in Ricelip. He enrolled as a medical student and drove his new coupe to the hospital. The fulfillment of his dream was in sight. He passed his first examinations brilliantly. The senior house surgeon offered his congratulations and a friendly warning. Congratulations, Martin. You've done very well. Oh, thanks very much, sir. But a word of advice from an old sawbones, Martin. Go steady on those trips to the West End. Don't let wild oats spoil your harvest, eh? Oh, yes, sir, I won't forget. Martin meant what he said. He would stop going out so much. He knew it didn't mix with the career of a medical student. All right, then. Just one last weekend as a final big splash. Then he would stop altogether. <laughs> A fortnight before his intermediate examinations, Martin knew he was not ready. Every weekend had been just the last, and his work had suffered. Feverishly, he tried to cram six months' work into two weeks. Then, on one of those sprees, every one which was to be the last, he got more than usually drunk and joined in a tour of nightclubs. On the morning of his examinations, Paul Martin found himself blinking at a guttering red candle in a cheap Soho dive. Oh, oh Lord, my head. What's the matter, love? Can't you take it? What? Oh, hello. Not very chummy, are you? It was different last night. I've got to get out of here. What's the hurry? I've got to go. I have an exam this morning. Oh. Oh, what a fool I was last night. I can hardly see. Oh, you and your silly old exam. You don't understand. I've got to get through. Well, don't sound so cross about it. Here, take this. Martin blinked blearily at the girl's outstretched hand. In it was a tiny heap of powder, like a pinch of salt. What is it? Coke, of course. What do you think? Fancy me having to tell a medical student what coke is. Come on, sniff it up. It'll make you feel like you're on top of the world. Martin took the cocaine and found the girl was right. It did brighten him up. He didn't like the idea of taking drugs, but after all, it was only just one dose. What could be the harm in it? He got through the morning's work with ease, but by lunchtime, the effects of the cocaine had worn off. Martin began to shiver. The afternoon's exams were surgery. He would need a steady hand. He had to do something. So whilst the hospital staff were at lunch, Martin went to the accident ward cupboard and injected a quarter of grain of morphine sulfate into his arm. He felt better at once. That afternoon, his fingers were steady and sure. He did well in the examinations. <laughs> At the end of three weeks of examinations, the quarter grain had become a half, three quarters, until finally it needed a full drain of the drug four times daily to keep the horrors at bay. Martin stole as much as he dared, diluted it with hyacinth, even quinine, to try to spin it out. At 
at last came that inevitable morning when the senior house surgeon addressed the assembled staff. For several weeks, drugs have been disappearing. At the next efficiency, I shall inform the police. If anybody wishes to speak to me privately, I shall do all in my power to assist. Nobody spoke. A pulse was jerking in Paul Martin's throat. The day was past when he could do without the drug. And so was born the mad scheme to obtain supplies of morphine from a chemist on a false prescription. A scheme that ended in the police station and later in court. Martin, we're going to hold you on the lightest charge we can. That of obtaining drugs by false prescription. The police will ask the court for a suspended sentence so that you can enter a nursing home where you can be treated. Thank you. You're very kind. The police did all they could. They would have liked to do more. Fabian had hopes of writing a happy ending to the story, but it was not to be. Martin came out of the nursing home uncured. All his fortune went on buying drugs from the peddlers of Soho. Sometimes they sold him the real thing. More often they swindled him with baking powder. He sold his car to get enough drug to keep him normal for four days. He stole the deed of his mother's house and borrowed money on it. His mother lost the house and went back to live on the charity of relatives. And so life dragged on for Paul Martin. Sixteen years of utter misery, corruption and torture. And here is Mr. Fabian's footnote. This story was typical of the most distressing kind of case the police have to deal with. And like all such cases, it is a grave indictment of the incredible stupidity of anyone who thinks he can get away with taking drugs. In the years since 1934, Paul Martin has been in and out of prison many times. His last punishment was for a clumsily attempted illegal operation which he hoped would bring him a few shillings for drugs. I don't know whether the body of this tragic human being is still alive, but to me, the real Paul Martin died in that year of 1934. Next week, I will deal with a murder case that had an unusual angle, the case of the Midget Hercules. Hercules.